We want to move on now and talk about patient assessment. And I'm going to be using an A, B, C, D, E protocol. And this is largely taken from trauma, but it applies to patients with shock, whatever the cause really. So what are our priorities going to be in any situation? Well, our first priority, and this is after trauma, is airway with C-spine control. But in any situation, the priority is going to be airway. We have to make sure that the patient's airway is patent first. That is the first thing we need to assess. If the airway is not patent, we address that straight away. We do that first. Next, we need to make sure that the patient is breathing and ventilating their lungs. That's the next thing to check out. And again, if the patient's not breathing and ventilating, we need to attend to that before we go on. And with shocked patients, we always want to make sure that the oxygen saturations are 95% or higher. So at this stage, we could put some oxygen on to increase the oxygenation if it's below 95%. C is for circulation and haemorrhage control. We need to assess the status of the patient's circulatory system. And again, in trauma, if there's a risk of hypovolemia, we want to be arresting haemorrhage at this stage to prevent the hypovolemia from getting any worse. D is for disability. And what this really means is a neurological examination. What is the neurological status of our patient? is their nervous system injury. E is for exposure. And in trauma, we need to completely expose the patient so we can look at them all over in case we miss a wound or we miss some blood that's leaking out from somewhere at the back that you might not have noticed. And it also stands for more detailed examinations as well. For example, we want to know what the patient's blood sugar level is. We want to know what the patient's body temperature is. So this is the first assessment in any patient, particularly thinking about a traumatised patient, but true for anyone. Airway with C-spine control, breathing and ventilation, C for circulation and haemorrhage, D for disability neurological examination, and E for exposure. But as well as that, we need to keep on reassessing these. Some people think that once these have been assessed, that's the end of the matter. Well, it's not. Of course, they need continuously reassessed. For example, in traumatised patients, especially in children, gastric distension is quite common and the stomach can blow up. Especially if the consciousness levels are reduced, the patient can vomit and that can lead to aspiration as a result of gastric distension. And that would take us right back to the start because the aspiration would be compromising A for airway. So you might want to think about a nasogastric decompression tube to reduce the possibility of um, gastric regurgitation and airway compromise. But fairly easy to remember A, B, C, D and E. It's vital to be able to recognise if any of our patients are going into shock. Because one of the worst things that could happen is that a patient is, is developing shock and I don't realise it. Then I'm not in a position to try and report it and treat it. So I've got to recognise if shock is developing. So how am I going to do that? Well, let's think about how we're going to recognise early developing shock in the classical forms of hypovolemic, cardiogenic and obstructive shock. What clinical features are we going to be looking for? Well, one of the first things to change is that the heart rate will increase. The patient will develop a tachycardia. Now, remember that cardiac output equals heart rate multiplied by stroke volume. So if there's not enough blood coming back to the heart, there's no blood to pump out or not enough blood to pump out. So the stroke volume is going to go down. So to try and maintain cardiac output, the heart will beat more quickly. It's what you call a compensatory mechanism. It's a compensatory tachycardia. And th this gives rise to the classic presentation of the pulse, which is fast, weak and thready in a shocked patient. The pulse is fast, there's a tachycardia. It's weak because there's not a good volume of blood going through the artery. And it's thready. Again, instead of having a nice volume to it, it feels very thin. Fast, weak and thready because 
the heart is beating fast and small volumes of blood are being pumped out into the systemic arterial circulation per contraction. So tachycardia, fast, weak, thready pulse. Now blood pressure, of course, equals cardiac output times peripheral resistance. So another compensatory mechanism is that there is peripheral vasoconstriction. There is constriction of the blood vessels to the hands and feet and the surface of the skin. There's a cutaneous vasoconstriction. And because there's a vasoconstriction, the peripheral resistance is going to increase and that's going to, again, maintain blood pressure for a period, for a period of time. It's another compensatory mechanism. But it's also good because it means we can recognise it. If there's not enough blood going to the surface of the body, there's a peripheral vasoconstriction, the patient will develop pallor, they will look cold. And the hands and feet will be cold because there's not enough blood going to their peripheries, not enough blood going to the hands and feet. And the capillary refill time will be extended because there's not enough blood going down to the fingers and the capillary time, refill time will be longer than normal because there's no blood or lower volumes of blood to fill up those capillaries again. So extended capillary refill time. Another early clinical indicator is increased respiratory rate. There'll be a tachypnea. The patient will be breathing quicker. And there's two mechanisms explain this. One is the hypoxia because hypoxia will stimulate respiratory effort to try and get more oxygen in, the patient will be breathing faster. And then later on, when shock has become more developed, there will be a lactic acidosis. Because remember, the metabolism in the tissues changes from aerobic to anaerobic. That means lactic acid is produced. That lactic acid will leach out of the tissues into the circulation, causing a lactic acidosis. And of course, acidosis is a major stimulator of respiratory effort. And then there'll be a lowered pulse pressure. Now, a pulse pressure is the difference between the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure. So a shock is developing, the systolic pressure might come down, but the diastolic pressure tends to be maintained as a result of the peripheral vasoconstriction, at least for a period of time. So you can have maintained diastolic pressure, but a reduction in systolic pressure, and that means the gap between the two pressures, the pulse pressure, is going to be reduced. So here's a good saying, any injured patient who is cool and tachycardic, in other words, peripherally vasoconstricted, with a compensatory tachycardia is considered to be in shock until proved otherwise. And as shock develops, there's progressive hemodynamic collapse. There is progressive, a progressive reduction in the amount of blood perfusing the peripheral tissues and indeed progressively the central tissues, the organs of the body. So we've already looked at the skin, which is going to be pale and cold. But the kidneys themselves are also going to be hypoperfused. And if there's not enough blood going to the kidneys, there'll be a reduction in glomerular filtration rate. And that can lead to an oliguria, a reduction in the amount of urine produced. And eventually that can lead to an anuria because of reduced perfusion of blood through the kidneys. An anuria being production of no urine at all. So we want to make sure that patients have got an adequate production of urine. This is why shocked patients are often catheterised. And we want to make sure that an adult is producing 0.5 mils of urine per kilogram of body weight per hour. In other words, if a patient weighs 60 kilograms, we want to make sure they're producing at least 30 mils of urine per hour. In children, the figure's higher, actually. We want to make sure that children are producing about one mil of urine per kilogram of body weight per hour. And in a, in a baby under one year of age, they should be producing about two mils of urine per kilogram of body weight per hour. And also, the central nervous system can become hypoperfused, particularly the brain. 
And how do we recognise it if the brain is becoming hypoperfused? Well, one of the first things, actually, is that the patient starts to feel anxious. So whenever a patient feels anxious, it's always worth checking their pulse rate, checking their breathing rate, looking for peripheral vasoconstriction, checking their blood pressure, because anxiety can be caused by hypoperfusion of the brain. And as this gets worse, the patient becomes confused, possibly disorientated. And as it gets worse still, they become lethargic. And as it gets worse still, the level of consciousness will start to reduce. So as the brain becomes hypoperfused, first there's increasing levels of anxiety, then there's confusion, then lethargy, then reduction in the Glasgow Coma Scale. So if we identify that a patient is going into shock, the next thing we need to do is identify the cause and the type of shock. And this will usually be fairly straightforward. So if someone's got a history of uh, bleeding or burns or diarrhea and vomiting, we would suspect a hypovolemic shock. If they've got a history of chest pain or cardiac problems, we would expect, uh, suspect a cardiogenic shock. If they'd have had a history of deep venous thrombosis, we might suspect uh, an obstructive type of shock. If they'd been ill with a fever for some time before, we might suspect the development of a septic shock. If they'd been exposed to something which might cause an allergy, like a bee sting, or a type of food that someone was allergic to, or a drug that we'd given them, we might suspect an allergic shock. Or if there'd been a history of spinal trauma, or if the patient had had an emotional upset or pain, we might suspect a vasovagal type of neurogenic shock. So usually fairly obvious what type of shock a patient is suffering from. And as we find out something is wrong, as we've said before, we treat it simultaneously. So some of these things need treated very quickly. For example, if someone's had an allergic shock, you might only have a, a minute or two to save that patient's life. And we'll look at the precise treatments that we can offer that uh, shortly. Now, after trauma, shock is often described as hemorrhagic or non-hemorrhagic. What do we mean here? Well, we might have a traumatised patient who is in shock, and it may be that it is because they've lost blood. It's a hemorrhagic type of shock. But patients after trauma can go into shock even if they're not bleeding, if they're not losing blood. So, for example, after a deceleration injury, like after a fall or in a road traffic accident where someone has decelerated very quickly, there can be blunt damage to the myocardium leading to a reduction in myocardial contractility and a form of cardiogenic shock. It's after trauma, but it's not a hemorrhagic shock. Or if there's penetrating injury to the chest after trauma, there can be cardiac tamponade developing with bleeding into the pericardial sac. Or again, after trauma, there can be a tension pneumothorax causing the displacement of the major vessels, also leading to shock. So remember, after trauma, shock can be hemorrhagic or non-hemorrhagic. But having identified those types of non-hemorrhagic shock, it's important to realise that by far and away the most common cause of shock after trauma is bleeding, is a hemorrhagic type of shock.